I always heard such great things about Jim Crockett Sr. He was really well respected, not only in the Carolinas with the wrestling fans, but as far as the wrestling business in general was concerned, all the, the talent, all the wrestlers. Um, he had come to the Carolinas in the 30s and started promoting wrestling. And also they did minor league baseball, uh, the Harlem Globetrotters. He had a hand in, in a lot of bringing a lot of big entertainment events uh, to Charlotte for years. But wrestling was always the backbone. and. The Jim Crockett Sr. was a guy who, even though he had money, he didn't show it to people. There's always a story he drove an old car because he said, hey, if the wrestling fans pay their hard-earned money to come to the matches and they see me driving up in some, you know, limousine, then uh, what, kind of, what kind of picture does that throw off? He wanted to, to, the wrestling fans to realize that he cared about them and he was just like them. Uh, he'd do a lot of his business from a, from a table in a restaurant. Um, you know, he, he was very old time uh, promoter all the way, but he was respected because he, he treated the, the talent well and, and he made sure to take care of the business for the fans. And he was kind of the godfather for what this would become. Well, exactly. You know, Jim Crockett Promotions obviously uh, wouldn't have been anything without Jim Crockett. And then later on when, when, uh, when Jim Jr. took over, David, Francis, Jackie, um, they tried to carry that on, but the name that Jim Crockett Sr. had given wrestling in the Carolinas was, was so strong and so good, but I think he died in 73. Uh, that's when some changes were made and the territory got even bigger. Okay. You know a lot about tag team wrestling. Just kind of give me like the background of tag team. I'm trying to get somebody to give me the history of the tag team wrestling because it was a tag team territory when he started it. Just kind of tell me a little bit about tag team wrestling and just kind of talk about how the territory was a tag team territory. It, tag team wrestling goes back to the 30s. The, the first great tag team were the Dusick brothers, the Dirty Dusicks from Nebraska, and they were the first heel tag team in wrestling. Um, everybody likes to take credit for inventing tag team wrestling. Uh, Texas, Paul Bosch would take credit for it, or another territory would take credit for it. Sometimes it was called Australian tag team wrestling. Um, but while nobody really knows exactly the first place it started, the Carolinas for years, the 50s and 60s, was built on tag team wrestling. You had the Kentuckians, uh, the Bolos, who were the assassins uh, everywhere else, um, uh, the Scott brothers. Uh, you know, it, the, the list of tag teams would go on and on, Weaver and Becker. And it was built as a tag team territory, even six-man tags sometimes when they'd get the manager involved. If, you know, if Homer Odell managed a, a heel tag team, then they'd get another baby face and they'd have, have uh, six-man tags. But it was a tag team territory through much of the 50s and 60s, Rip Hawk and Sweet Hanson. And that was, uh, that was the way it was built. And then it, that didn't change until after Jim Sr. had passed away, George Scott came in as Booker, and he wanted to elevate the singles and elevate the... Uh, the, the, the level of talent, bring some new talent in. Because that's one thing about the Carolinas, they were so successful that you almost had to drive the, the talent out of the territory with a stick because everybody wanted to stay there, everybody wanted to homestead. Uh, so that's where you got, you know, uh, of course with that number of towns um, in just the Carolinas and Virginia, through the 60s and 70s, they'd run two, three shows a night. And so even if you were in the territory regularly, Charleston, South Carolina may not see you but once every three or four shows. So you could stay a long time but still the changes had to be made. But for 20 years tag teams were the uh, the primary draw in, in mid-Atlantic wrestling. Alright, I'm going to just say a few of the tag team names. Just give me a little short 
what you think of. Okay. And you mentioned a few of them already, the Kentuckians. Well, Grizzly Smith, I got to know real well in Mid-South Wrestling when he was a road agent for, for Cowboy Bill Watts. But at the time, the Kentuckians were a great attraction. They weren't, let's put it this way, they weren't the Briscoe brothers in the ring as far as technical wrestling. But at that time, nobody was that size. Grizzly Smith was 6'9", 6'10", over 300 pounds. Luke Brown was almost as big. So you had these two giants. Uh, the people in the Carolinas, especially back in those days, they loved some hillbillies. Um, they could identify, so they were, they were huge baby faces. Uh, the people loved them, and of course they had to have the, uh, the protagonists or the antagonists to work with the protagonists, so that's where you had the Bolos, who were the assassins, uh, Jody Hamilton and Tom Renesto. Uh, they were the assassins everywhere else, but there had been a rip-off assassin tag team in the territory before, so they changed their names and became the Bolos. And the Bolos and the Kentuckians worked for years on and off in a variety of territories, but the Carolinas probably were where they were, they were most successful, and they sold out night after night. Uh, tell me a little bit about George Becker and Johnny Weaver. I mean, Johnny Weaver continued <coughs> on after Becker kind of was forced out, but just kind of talk yeah. about that tag team just a little bit. I'll tell you what, they, Johnny Weaver in the late 80s when he was doing television commentary, I walked over there one time while I was at ringside for a Midnight Express match, and I said, what are you laughing about, Weaver? My guys are going to win. You shouldn't be laughing. George Becker carried you on his back for 25 years. <laughs> he started laughing, too. Um, Weaver had come in as a, as a young baby face, good-looking kid. George Becker had been there for years. He had been the booker. He had been a top star. He was getting up in years. So the tag team of Weaver and Becker gave Weaver a rub from the established star, gave the older guy who was in the twilight of his career a chance to just take the tag from the younger kid, and, uh, and they were successful that way, you know, for a long time. And then finally it just, it, it came to the point, I, I talked about uh, talent didn't want to leave the Carolinas because the, the territory was so great. It was great living in the Carolinas. The business was always run well. It was always successful. You made money. And finally, they had to say, you know, to George Becker, from what I've heard, you're too old, you, we've, you know, no more. So then Weaver uh, had other partners and, and was successful as a single on his own, but, uh, but that's how he got the start, by being a partner of the established star. Tell me about Hawk and Hanson. They were a big staple there, too. Oh, yeah. Well, Rip Hawk uh, just passed away not long ago. Hawk was the talker. Hanson was the muscle. And they, they actually, Hawk later on gave the, uh, the rub to Ric Flair. When they brought Ric Flair in the territory, his first tag team partner was, was Rip Hawk. But Hawk and Hanson, once again, had that, that formula. They, they, they rode together, they trained together, they worked together, never had a crossword, but they were able to, you know, work magic in the ring as a tag team. And they were the antagonist to, once again, to a lot of the, the popular tag teams. Hawk would go out and he'd do the promo and he'd stir people up. And then he always had the big guy behind him who didn't say that much, but he, you know, look at Sweet Hanson. He could legitimately, but he looked like he could beat the crap out of anybody. Yeah. Uh, tell me about J.C. Dykes. I think J.C. Dykes and the Inferno. J.C. Dykes and the Infernos, they were a big team uh, when I was a kid uh, here in the, in the Memphis Territory. Uh, but once again, J.C. Dykes was one of the old-fashioned, old-style managers, and I mean that in a, in a good way. Um, you know, he had the cane, he got a lot of heat, he had the, the suits, the tuxedos, whatever. He was Jimmy Dykes from, uh, from I think, Cleveland, Tennessee. But, uh, you know, paired with the Infernos, that was, they traveled a lot of different territories, but once again, because the Carolinas was such a tag team territory, uh, they had great success there. I'm trying to remember now, Scared it out of me. Who were the Infernos at that time? It was Rocky Smith. I have no idea. Well, just act like I didn't say that because I can't remember. I can't remember who they were at that time. But, they, you know, and those guys, eh, most of the time when you had masked guys, it's because for whatever reason, they, they could work, but they didn't have the appearance. They didn't, they didn't have the physical charisma to look at them and say, wow, those guys are stars. But if you put the mask on them and add the element of mystery, uh, then, and Mr. Wrestling too, Johnny Walker, he had a whole second career bigger than his first because Johnny was a great wrestler, looked older than he was, and as he got older, he looked older still, and it was tough to buy him as a, 
you know, as a main event top baby face, but when he put the mask on and nobody knew who it was and he'd already retired a, a year earlier publicly just to throw people off the track, you know, then he, he was bigger as Mr. Wrestling too than he ever was as Johnny Walker. And there was a lot of masked tag team back in those days. The yeah, and the Crockett's, they probably did a little bit of what, uh, probably not as much as what Nick Goulas did. Nick Goulas in Tennessee, when he had a mass tag team, the, the interns or the infernos or the medics or the blue demons or whatever, Goulas had such a big territory that he would run two, three, four towns in a night over the several state area. And whichever town had the best advance would get the real interns and another, te another team under the mask would go to the spot show or whatever. I'm not saying the Crockett's did that. Uh, but there, there certainly was an element of, of switcheroo in those days with the mask guys. One of my favorites was uh, Skull Murphy and Brute Bernard. Um, Skull Murphy and Brute Bernard were, they were a takeoff on the classic French Angel motif, the freaks, because they, they had that look, especially with the shaved heads, and they, and they weren't, you know, matinee idol guys anyway. So classic heels. And uh, I remember Brute Bernard, uh, after Skull Murphy died, Brute Bernard came here with, with the, uh, the angel, Frank Morrell, uh, the modern angel rather than the one from the 40s. And Homer O'Dell managed them for a while, and they were just the three ugliest human beings. And how could you like them? But I loved them because they were great. You know, Brute was crazy. And, uh, and Frank Morell was a guy who gave me a lot of advice and a lot of help when I started out. He actually worked in the Carolinas for quite some time also. Um, and the team that really had the most staying power over that period and went on into the 70s was the Anderson brothers. It well, was, yeah. And it was Gene and Lars at first, and then eventually Ole would come in. Just kind of talk to me about them. And Gene, Gene Anderson was the only real Anderson. Um, Lars, at first... Uh, was, was his partner, and then later on, Ole came in from Minnesota. I think Ole always fit better as an Anderson brother as they evolved than, than Lars did. And of course, there's not much footage left, you know, of the original Andersons. But yeah, that, that's the thing, you save the best for last, we're talking about them. The Anderson brothers epitomized tag team wrestling, and they epitomized what the Carolinas was all about. And even after the change was made from the 50s and 60s where primarily all the main events were tag team matches to the 70s where Johnny Valentine, Wahoo McDaniel, et cetera, came and, and established the singles title as, as being the, the most important thing, the Andersons were always over. The Andersons, they could work. That's, that's the thing, when, when a wrestler wanted to get into the Carolinas, they knew they had to be good workers. They knew they had to be talented. They knew they, they had to be able to go in the ring. They couldn't take shortcuts. It wasn't a territory that relied heavily on blood. It wasn't a territory that relied heavily on chairs and, and brawling and et cetera. You had to be able to go in the ring. It was the Cadillac of territories. And Gene and Ole epitomized that. They would ground you and pound you. They'd work the arm. Great tag team teamwork, but nobody ever came off the top rope. I don't think Gene or Ole ever, maybe, well, Ole did with the, with the, he'd come off and do the knee on the arm, but it wasn't like he was Ricky Steamboat. But that was the Anderson brother style, and that influenced uh, not only everybody that came after, but also it influenced who the fans bought as really tough guys and top wrestlers. Because if you didn't look or appear like you could hang with the Anderson brothers, they weren't going to take you as a main eventer in the Carolinas. I don't know if you know anything about this, but when Jim Sr. died and Jr. took over, there was a guy also named John Ringley. John Ringley. I don't know if <clears throat> that's really worth going into. Well. He was supposed to take over, but he like cheated on Francis or something. That's let, me, let me give you a sound bite. You can use it if you want to. Yeah, because we're going to talk. <clears throat> it might be a little short touch on things since it did happen. Yeah. Um, when Jim Crockett Sr. passed away, the guy that was first picked to run the company was named John Ringley. He was Francis Crockett's husband, and he had already been involved in the office. Uh, I think David at that point was probably had just gotten out of college and was trying to be a wrestler, David Finley, which was his middle name, and Jim Crockett Sr. said, my boy wants to be a wrestler. Treat him just like you treat the other guys. Don't give him any favors, and they beat the piss out of David Crockett, and his, his wrestling career was short-lived, as I'm sure he would tell you. Um, and Jim Crockett Jr. Uh, was, I'm sure, probably not happy that his father had picked John Ringley to run the business. 
but that was a transition period of 73 to 74 or so, and then John Ringley got caught with his, not his finger in the cookie jar, but something else. He wasn't stealing money, but he was not uh, being faithful to Francis, let's put it that way. And as the story goes, he was unceremoniously asked to leave the company and the family at the same time. Then that's when the mantle fell on, on Jim Crockett Jr. To, to be the guy to run the company. And just reading and doing research, a lot of people didn't respect him when he kind of took over because you know, some people said he was never around it, but some people said he was, I'm not sure. But he kind of had to earn that respect when he got it. And I, a lot of people say they give him a lot of credit for being smart about bringing in George Scott as the booker. Well, Jim Crockett Jr. had big shoes to fill, big pants to fill, literally. Jim Sr. was a 300-something pound man. He was a big, larger-than-life guy. He was the promoter that everybody had known for, for 40 years in that area. And all of a sudden, he's gone. There's changes in the company. Jim Jr. is running the thing. And I think he did have to earn the guy's respect. Um, because let's face it, you know, anytime you follow somebody that's larger than life like that, you're going to have to earn the respect. And uh, in wrestling, it's, it's really hard to get the guys on your side. But at the same time, he brought in George Scott as Booker. I never had a, uh, uh, anything good to say about George Scott from my dealings with him in WCW briefly in the, in the uh, late 80s when Turner Broadcasting bought the company. But I had always heard that George Scott was the architect of the you know, the resurgence of mid-Atlantic wrestling in the mid-70s, I think it came in large part, yes, he knew what he was doing. He'd been a wrestling star for years. He had been a booker in different places for years. But I think George Scott's biggest talent, maybe he had Alzheimer's when I met him in 89. I don't know. Uh, I was waiting to see genius. I didn't see it. And he was fired four months later for not being a genius. But George Scott's biggest talent, from what I've heard, is picking the right talent and letting that talent do what they wanted to do. In other words, he didn't go to Black Jack Mulligan and say, you're going to do this and do that and do the other thing. He'd go to Black Jack Mulligan and say, who do you want to work with? What do you want to do? He, he would talk to the top guys that he had in the territory that he trusted, the Wahoo McDaniels, the Black Jack Mulligans, the Anderson brothers, etc., whoever it may be, and he would say, who have you worked with in different places that you could redo something, that you had success with? That's actually how uh, the Kentuckians and the Bolos got together for that big program in the 60s. They had worked in different places, and the, the Bolos would go in and get heat, and then the Kentuckians would come in as the people who could finally knock these assholes off, right? Well, it's the same thing. Wahoo McDaniel would put in a word for this guy or that guy. And, and of course, then, as a matter of fact, I believe that's how they found Ric Flair, because Wahoo had worked for Vern Gagne in the AWA, and seen Ric Flair on the preliminary matches, but said, hey, this kid's got potential. He's got something. He's going places. Well, if I'm George Scott and I've got a guy like Wahoo McDaniel or Johnny Valentine or whoever that's drawing big money for me that puts their stamp of approval on somebody, I'm going to bring them in. I've actually done that a number of times, you know, when I was lucky enough to be the booker somewhere. It, you know, this guy's over and this guy knows what he's doing, so if, if he says the guy's good, I'll take his word for it. This was the transition from tag teams to singles, and I think the guy that really got that, you know, that focus over was uh, Johnny Valentine. What do you, yep. what do you remember of Johnny Valentine? Um, I was not lucky enough to see him in person. Uh, I've seen tape. I've obviously heard a lot of the stories. Um, toughest guy in the world, had a, like a Charles Dickens upbringing where he got in the business when he was only a teenager back in the late 40s and was stranded in a foreign country when the promoter left and, you know, everything was closed down and he battled his way to be one of the top stars in wrestling in the 50s and 60s all over the country, all over the world. He, he, was, he was a different guy from what I've heard, but he was, everybody universally says he was the toughest guy in the ring. He wanted you to hit him hard. He wanted to hit you hard, so he, if, if he was going to hit you hard, he knew you were going to hit him hard. He didn't care. Um, and he was a guy that took a long time to get over. He didn't do anything flashy. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to go out there and do 20 million high spots. He was going to make sure that people believed in him. And then you would bring a guy like that in. You would let, himself, let him smash himself over by just beating the piss out of people. And then you would find somebody on the other side the baby face, that the people could legitimately believe had a chance against this guy that nobody could stop, and there came Wahoo McDaniel. And, I mean, I've seen Wahoo 
hit people so hard their chest bleed. I've, I, Wahoo, when he, when he was a heel and fans would attack him, he would hit them with chops and knock, knock a fan who was not cooperating ass over tea kettle over three rows of chairs with a backhanded chop. And he said he would hit Johnny Valentine as hard as he possibly could. And Valentine would be, yeah, that's it, kid, keep going. Come on, <laughs> give it to me some more. And they would build those matches to where, you know, you talk to people from the Greensboro Coliseum from years ago, and they'd be sitting in the upper deck, and they could hear Valentine and Wahoo hitting each other. And, and that's, that's really what built singles wrestling in the Carolinas because the people would say, well, I don't care what anybody says about wrestling. This stuff's real. Those guys are real. We got to see what's going to happen. And that's, that was the catalyst. And then, you know, you had uh, just the best talent in the, in the 70s come in as far as the singles, uh, singles ranks were concerned, whether it be Steamboat or Piper or Blackjack or Valentine. All those guys could go. They were all world-class talents. So, but it, it uh, Greg Valentine, I should say, two of them. But it all started with Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDaniel, the transition from tags to singles. Another thing that they did was they created a U.S. title that kind of made that the, the main focus, singles title. Kind of just talk about how important. I know they had one in Detroit and all other places, right. and they finally got one here, and that kind of became a, the title here. Well, you, you had to have, uh, every territory had their regional championships. Even a territory that was affiliated with the NWA would have a regional championship. Now, for years, the tag team title in the Carolinas uh, was the uh, Atlantic Coast tag title uh, because that was, uh, you know, a regional championship. But then as, as tag teams got more important and Gene and Ole Anderson, et cetera, they got their own world tag team title. That's one thing, the NWA would not let you have another world champion but there were a few NWA World Tag Team titles floating around. The Carolinas version was probably the most important. But also, uh, the singles championships had been the Eastern States heavyweight title. Uh, there had been a few regional championships, but with the talent level, with the Valentines and the McDaniels and the, the Mulligans and the Mr. Wrestling, Tim Woods and et cetera, I think they almost, seemed, they almost thought that it needed to be more important. It needed to sound bigger. United States heavyweight champion sounds, it's not the world champion, but it's not just the Eastern States or the Southern or the, you know, it, it's a little bit bigger. And the talent level deserved it. So when they brought the U.S. title in, they had a, a tangible prize that these top name wrestlers that you read about in the magazines, that you, that you saw from other territories, from other major promotions, something that they would really want to fight over and, and prize and, and, uh, and it, it just made, once again, it made the perception of the singles championship and the singles matches more important. Now, back in, in, the, uh, in the 50s and 60s, if you go back through the old wrestling magazines, Gene Gordon was the, the famous photographer in the Carolinas, but the Carolinas didn't get a lot of magazine coverage. They, they weren't running the, the biggest arena in town yet, even though there were weekly shows or bi-weekly shows all through the 60s, and, and they ran so many events. They weren't drawing the huge crowds, but they were doing steady, consistent business. But the magazines didn't cover them because Weaver and Becker may be stars in the Carolinas, but because they stayed there for so long, they weren't stars to other places. So the, the magazines based out of New York would only cover the stars that traveled or the stars in the major media centers. But then that changed in the 70s also. When, when those big names started coming into the Carolinas, then all of a sudden the New York Magazine started focusing on them and they started getting more publicity. So now instead of, you know, this guy, I'm not going to mention anybody in a derogatory fashion, but in, instead of a regional star going after a regional championship, now it was a national star going for a, a United States championship. It was bigger. Uh, about the talent level, just kind of tell me about the talent that they had at this, this era. Okay. Um, the talent, especially in the late 70s, as far as nationally recognized wrestling stars was off the charts. And Greensboro was the, even though Charlotte was the base of the promotion, Greensboro was the heart. Matter of fact, when Dusty Rhodes was booking and, and the syndicated TV, both of them played in Greensboro, but there was an A show, and instead of an A and a B show, there was an A show and a G show, Greensboro. 
because Mid-Atlantic and Worldwide, the G Show had a better time slot in Greensboro, so he always booked that secondary show in other places as to be the main show for Greensboro because it was so important. But it, it just in one show at the Greensboro Coliseum, you would have Paul Jones, Ricky Steamboat, Ole and Gene Anderson, Ric Flair, Greg Valentine, Wahoo McDaniel, Andre the Giant, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, Tony Atlas, Bobo Brazil, Mr. Wrestling, Johnny Weaver, Black Jack Mulligan, Stan Hansen, Ken Patera, The Mass Superstar, Baron Von Raschke, all on the same show. That didn't happen anywhere else in the country. And, and the crowds that Greensboro put up uh, were able to pay those guys to be there, obviously, or they wouldn't have been there. But when you see that level of talent at that point in time and in, in cities, let's face it, in the Carolinas that weren't that big in relation to New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, but the level of talent was, was comparable with anywhere and, and the, the level of, of work. And so those people, they got to see the best talent and they got used to good matches. They got spoiled too. <laughs> you can't keep that up forever. Greensboro was noted, obviously, for Starcade, but for years before that, the annual Thanksgiving Tag Team Tournament, which was always a sellout. Um, Greensboro was the scene of Kernodal and Slaughter against uh, Steamboat and Youngblood that set the all-time attendance record and, you know, closed the interstate down. But just regular events in Greensboro, there was one show at the Coliseum in the late 70s that had Harley Race and Ricky Steamboat for the NWA World Championship, Flair against Dusty Rhodes for the U.S. title with Buddy Rogers, the original Nature Boy, as a special referee, and then the Mid-Atlantic heavyweight title, which once again was a secondary title, but that was Ken Patera and Dino Bravo, who were two big stars at that time. And that may seem like a lot of championships, but everything came together in Greensboro. Now, one night, the Mid-Atlantic championship might be in the main event in Charleston, South Carolina, but in Richmond, Virginia, the U.S. title may be on the line the same night. So uh, people got to see an incredible variety of talent. And now you can put that down. <laughs> I don't mind holding it. Uh, another guy that kind of came in in the 70s, well, maybe a little early 80s, was Roddy Piper. And people think he was just a WWF guy, but he really was hot for yeah. Crockett's too. I mean, he was so different. Um, Roddy Piper came to the Carolinas in 1979. And he had already been in wrestling for a number of years, but not on a mainstream basis, not in a, a high profile position. I think he came from the Los Angeles territory, which was at that point kind of on its last legs. He had wrestled in Portland for Don Owen. That's where he got his first break as a top guy. But Portland didn't get a lot of publicity. So when he came to the Carolinas, all of a sudden he could talk like that. The promos were off the charts. And he could also wrestle, even though he was, you know, that big around in those days, he had that mouth and he could fight and he could go. And I think that's, it, it was just something different. You know, the Carolinas at that point was, even though they were used to the top talent, they were used to the big burly top talent. Whether you were a healer or a baby face, you could get the job done. But then along came this smart aleck kid that everybody wanted to see, you know, get put in his place. And... It, it took a while. Gradually, the transition came where people had to recognize the talent, and, and they started to love to hate him, and then they just started to love him. But at first, he had a ton of heat. Uh, Crockett got his television on in Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1980, I believe it was, which is 90 miles up the road from Louisville. So I found out that if I wiggled my antenna, I could watch Mid-Atlantic Wrestling on television back in the days before cable and, and uh, back in the days before VCRs, really. And uh, uh, obviously, Piper was a huge influence on me. because I'm Roddy Piper, and you're not. You know, well, he's, he's doing Chevy Chase, but nobody in wrestling did any pop culture references then. And then the younger generation came in, and it started being more common, but Piper was the first. But then we got the chance, I would throw my friends in the car and we'd go up to Cincinnati and go to the Cincinnati Gardens and, and see Mid-Atlantic Wrestling Live. And that's where I got to see Snuka, who was just an animal, just incredible. The athleticism was unbelievable. And Piper and Flair and Valentine. But I'll never forget, Piper had so much heat and Cincinnati was a rough town back in those days for wrestling. On the way to the ring one night, I'm sitting like sixth row ringside, and it took, it took effort to get that close because they were drawing big crowds in Cincinnati. But I've, I'm looking, here comes Piper down the aisle, and all of a sudden this guy came out of the third row and just waylaid him with a shot. Bam! 
And Piper sold it and turned around and got on that guy and they went down and I'm standing up on the chair and all I see is Piper's fist above all the other stuff. His fist is going up and down and up and down. He wailed on that guy until the cops could drag what was left of him away. So anybody that thought that Piper was a pushover in Cincinnati from that point on knew different. I mean, they, they carried the guy out. He, he was like that when, when Piper got finished with him. And he shouldn't have stood up and punched Piper in the face. But uh, he had that kind of heat, and, and it was just, it was the gift of gab, but also he'd get in the ring and back it up. And the, the guy that really defined the Crockett era came in during this period and mentioned his name already, Ric Flair. Just kind of talk about a young Ric Flair. I know they tagged him with Hanson, Hulk, it's one of those guys, but really when he got with Valentine and they started to groom him for the, the top spot, just kind of talk about him some during this period. Yeah. Um, Flair came in in 1974. And that was right when the transition was happening with, uh, from Ringley to, to George Scott. Wahoo had recommended Flair from, from uh, seeing him in the AWA where he was still wrestling preliminaries. He'd only been wrestling about 18 months at that point. And he was, he was fat Rick. He weighed like 280, 290. You know, he was huge. He was in shape, but he was also, you know, he was stocky. Let's put it that way. And you could tell that there was something to him. He had the gift of gab. He had a promo. Even back then, there's never been a gimmick with Ric Flair. Ric Flair, the nat he's been the nature boy even before they called him the nature boy. Um, so you could see the, the potential. And they put him with Rip Hawk, who was a veteran. They thought Hawk can do all the talking. Well, then as soon as they heard Flair open his mouth, they said, okay, he doesn't need that. But Hawk was a star. He gave the young kid the rub. I think they, they might have even been cousins at first. And then that was kind of forgotten about. The plane crash happened. Flair was off for that period of time, but he dropped the weight and came back looking more like the nature boy that we, we know today. But even before the plane crash, he had been in some high profile matches. I've seen some video with, with him and Wahoo where it just, it's funny to see Flair at that size, but he was, he was starting the face first bump, starting the chops. He was a little over the top and you could tell he was a little green around the edges, but you could also see, you know, this, this guy's gonna be a star. Then after the plane crash, when he came back, he was slimmer and sleeker and started to flesh out the Nature Boy uh, gimmick even more, hair a little bit longer, flashier robes, and then putting him with Valentine. At first it was, he, he not only was a cousin of the Andersons then at that point, uh, but also he was paired with Valentine because it was a great uh, modern day update of the, the Graham brothers or the classic bleach blonde you know, heel tag teams. And I remember Dennis Condry, when I first got with the Midnight Express and we were successful in Louisiana, Dennis Condry always wanted to go to the Carolinas because he had started there. Um, he had gotten in the business as, as a, a referee in the Carolinas about, gosh, 10 or 12 years before the Midnight got together. But he, he, he knew the stories and he knew it was a big money territory and he said it's, that's where he said it's the Cadillac of wrestling territories and he told me Ric Flair and Greg Valentine made 150 grand a year apiece three years in a row in the 70s. They were renting limousines to go to the shows just to have a write-off. Well, now that I know Flair personally, I don't know if he was renting a limousine just to have a write-off. I think he was just renting a limousine because it was Flair. But they had the kind of money to do that working in a three-state area because uh, the business was so strong and they were on top. So Flair and Valentine... Uh, especially when they did the program with the Andersons, where you had the two most hated tag teams, you know, in the territory head up. Uh, that's when you could see that Flair was going to be a main event player. And then by the time that that uh, uh, tandem was at an end and they started working with each other and Flair had had the run with Blackjack Mulligan that did record business. Flair and Blackjack Mulligan, as from what I was told in 1978, were the last people to sell out the Charlotte Coliseum, legitimate complete sellout until the Rock and Roll in the Midnight in 1986. Uh, they did tremendous business all over the territory. Flair had a ton of heat. People loved Black Jack. That's what really cemented him. He, Black Jack had been a heel, but uh, as, after he switched babyface and worked with Flair, that really cemented him as an icon. So they, it wasn't long after that, a uh, couple of years, they, they started sending Flair to St. Louis to Atlanta to be on TBS, uh, various NWA strongholds because they knew that he was either going to be or going to be one of the guys figured for the NWA world title and they wanted to get him exposed in as many 
uh, top markets as they could. So he was huge in St. Louis. Sam Muchnick loved him because he'd take a backdrop on those hard rings. The ring in St. Louis was like an old boxing ring. He went way up in the air, oh, and Flair would take the backdrop anyway. And he went to Atlanta and got on, on uh, WTBS then so people could see him on cable. He went to Florida. They really, they traveled him well. He made shots for, for Vince Sr. in Madison Square Garden. And they traveled him well, so by the time that 81 came around and he got the first, uh, the first run with the belt, the people knew who Ric Flair was, even more so than the Carolinas. But then it set up the dichotomy. Ric Flair, everywhere else in the country, was a dastardly heel when he was the NWA world champion in the early 80s. But by that time in the Carolinas, he had already become the hometown hero. So he would... Uh, he would basically be uh, the hero in the Carolinas and wrestle against the top heels, and then he'd go everywhere else in the country and wrestle the top baby faces. So a tremendous learning experience and tremendous exposure for a guy at that stage of his, his career. And just kind of briefly just kind of say something, you know, like this was the time period where it went from just wrestling to being labeled Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. So this is kind of when they kind of branded it as, as Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Okay. Just something short, something short, and that'll be the end of the 70s, and we'll get into the, okay. the good old days. The 70s were the point where instead of just wrestling at the Park Center in Charlotte or wrestling in Greensboro, it became Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. It was branded that way uh, with the Mid-Atlantic title coming in so that that way they had their own identity. It was, it was a, a brand name at that point where you could only see the major stars of professional wrestling for Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, and that's I think, is now what most of the fans in the Carolinas remember is Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. Okay. Uh, George Scott left. I, know, I think they had a falling out with Crockett Jr. I'm not sure what that was about. I don't think we need to talk about that. Just say he left. I think, <coughs> if I'm right, I think Ole Anderson eventually came in and became a bully. Kind of a, he, I, I think he had it for a while and was doing Georgia at the same time. And he kind of, <coughs> yeah. And he kind of neglected, <coughs> neglected Carolinas because he had so much on his plate. I know Tommy Young's told us that he ran it into the ground. <laughs> but what it, Tom, kinda, Tommy and Ole always Tommy, got along real well. Yeah. But uh, just kind of give me your thoughts on you know, Ole. Just kind of give me something. You know, George Scott yeah. left. He had a falling out, blah, blah, blah. And then Ole kind of came in. He was the booker and was piss poor or whatever. Yeah, I'm and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm not sure. I think it was Ole and then it was a booking committee. And then yeah. Became it was the booking committee. It, Ernie Ladd was involved. The Briscoes were involved. Dory was involved. And when did Gary Hart too? Gary Hart was involved. And we'll talk, I'll get to talk about that too. And, but I think okay. Ole had it. I think. I haven't talked to him yet. Um, skip, skip well, let, let, me, let me just give you something that you can use or not. But um, in the early 80s, George Scott left. There was a falling out, I've heard. Not sure, wasn't there, don't know what happened, but he ended up going to work for Vince McMahon. Um, but meanwhile, Ole Anderson came in, and Ole at one point was booking not only this giant Carolinas territory, but also Georgia as well. And the Anderson brothers were pretty much as iconic as a tag team in Georgia, which was a completely different territory, as they were in the Carolinas. Neighboring territories, but at the same point, you know, when, you, when you're doing two or three shows a night in the Carolinas with one crew of talent and you're doing at least a show a night in Georgia with another crew of talent and you've got cable television in Atlanta and you've got syndicated television in the Carolinas, that's a lot on your plate. And even though wrestling wasn't as complicated back then as it is today and overwritten and overproduced and homogenized, pasteurized, sanitized, etc., it was still a lot. Ole told me one time, he said, all the guys when I'm booking, they want a day off. What about me? When do I get a day off? I'm the booker. I think of people, things for people to do. What am I going to do? Get up one day and just not think? I never get a day off. So it, it, we, there was a breaking point where one of them had to give, and that's when they switched and, and went, to, uh, went to a committee of several different people. And Ernie Ladd was involved for, for a while. Gary Hart was involved. I think the Briscoes were involved. Um, and that not to uh, cast aspersions on any of those guys, but that period, 83, 84, was probably the only down period uh, in business
for Mid-Atlantic Wrestling and for the Carolinas from the mid-70s to the time that uh, Crockett sold to TBS. It, you know, it, it, it was hard to follow the incredible level of talent that they'd had for so many years there. Um, it was also, once again, maybe just that uh, the right things weren't clicking. But in 83 and 84, although the first Starcade happened in 83, the regular business in the territory was not at the level it was. It was, uh, it was a level people would kill for now. They'd cut their mother's throat to, to be drawing crowds and business like that now, but it, then for the Carolinas, it wasn't that good. But Dusty Rhodes had come up with the idea for Starcade. Dusty, it really, he learned from Eddie Graham. He learned from Bill Watts. Bill Watts learned from everybody. Everybody learned from Eddie Graham. Eddie Graham was like the learning tree, as, as Ernie Ladd would say. Uh, he was a, a genius booker. He, w he was an expert in professional wrestling, and he taught a lot of people and passed that down, Kevin Sullivan, etc. And Eddie Graham had been about package shows. Eddie Graham had been about big shows. And Bill Watts took that in Louisiana with the Superdome. Dusty took it to the Carolinas with the idea for Starcade. And even though Dusty wasn't booking in, at the time of the first Starcade, that's pretty much how he got the job because nobody had ever done that level of business before for one show in one night. This was before WrestleMania. So the idea of the, the major event uh, was, was born in the Carolinas and that would take off for the rest of the 80s. It was huge, whether it be Starcade in Greensboro, when they were smart enough to keep it in Greensboro, the Crockett Cup, the Great American Bash. Um, business actually did better as a result of the big events on a regular basis because instead of people saying, well, I'm just gonna wait to the big show, it made everything hotter. It made the, the whole business hotter. The fallout from Starcade, well, then we'll go to the Bunkhouse Stampede. Well, then we'll go to the Crockett Cup. Well, then we'll go to the Great American Bash. It was a steady stream that, that fueled the thing. And Dusty was, Dusty couldn't watch a budget. Dusty was not great for details, J.J. Dillon was. But Dusty was a genius when it came to promoting himself and when it came to promoting a big show. Well, since you mentioned Dusty, what did you think of him as a booker? <coughs> he was a genius with the big shows, but what overall as a booker? And then I had, <coughs> after you talk about that, my, my follow-up would be the term Dusty finish. Okay, well, I'll, I'll combine them because that's, there, so therein lies the rub. started to hurt business later in 86, yep. 87. Not 86, but 87, 88. Well, let me start out and give you a starting place. Dusty Rhodes, in my opinion, as a booker, most of the time was a genius. And he made us a lot of money. And he put a lot of faith in us, and he gave us a lot of experience. He taught me a lot. And as, as, a, as a wrestler, once again, he wasn't Luthez, but as a worker, he was off the charts. He could get himself over. He could talk himself over. He could become a personality that people wanted to see. And after a while of wrestling on top in every territory across the country and learning from guys like Eddie Graham and from guys like Bill Watts, he became a good booker. He knew what to do, but sometimes Dusty's only drawback was restraint in what not to do. Just because you had gotten away with some things for a long period of time didn't mean you shouldn't press your luck. Dusty Rhodes invented the Big Show concept. Once again, before WrestleMania, Dusty Rhodes invented Starcade. Dusty Rhodes was a master at peaking angles and programs to a big blow off. Dusty was tremendous at putting talent against each other that he knew would click and draw money with each other. The Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express. Midnight may draw money with this guy, but they're gonna draw a fortune with the Rock and Roll. Same thing Rock and Roll may do, but when we get here, it's gonna be magic. All strong points Dusty had. Dusty's weak spot was, as, as many people in the business would like to say, he'd, he'd draw 60 grand, but he'd spend 50 to do it. Would you be better off drawing 40 grand and only spending 20 than drawing 60 grand and spending 50? That's open to debate. But Dusty also went to the well too often on the classic finishes that worked like a charm the first time and worked okay the second time and worked pretty good the third time, but people started to get smartened up. I've been in that position where you're a booker and how much, how much more can you think of?
How many more times can we make a different shaped wheel, right? The dusty finish that actually, he didn't even invent it. When it was first done, 30 years earlier than that, it was the most controversial thing ever and necessitated rematches and sellouts everywhere. But then, as you do it and you do it, people can get tired of it. People can start to see through it. People can start to get pissed off by it. The second referee comes in and reverses the decision because the first referee didn't see what happened. That sold out everywhere the first time it was done. All those finishes sold out the first time everywhere it was done because if, if they hadn't sold out, nobody would have done them again. They worked in different territories, but when you were a national company now with national cable, you couldn't just do it in Charlotte and then you do it in Atlanta and then you do it in New Orleans and nobody knew. In this territory, in the days before the internet and before cable television in, in the Tennessee territory, they'd do the same finish in Memphis as they would the next day in Louisville, as the next day in Evansville, as the next day in Lexington. They'd change the titles every night of the week. Nobody knew. There was no way to know unless you physically followed all the wrestlers around every week. But with cable, with the advent of, of newsletters, and then the internet finished it off, you couldn't get away with it anymore. One time I went up to Dusty, I said, we were in Greensboro, and I think we were working with the Fantastics. And I said, Dusty, the, the finish you wanted us to do, because I always wrote them down in my book, right? I have my books with every finish we have ever did as, as a team with the Midnight Express. I said, Dusty, we did that here last month with the Road Warriors. He said, ah, don't worry, kid, it's two different people. They won't notice. They kind of noticed, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, who am I to criticize Dusty Rhodes? He's a genius. He'll never be duplicated. If he ever made mistakes, that was it. Not watching the bottom line and going to the well too often. We'll talk about the bottom line here in a little bit, but you mentioned uh, Starcade. Just kind of give me a little brief background. <laughs> on I mean, you know, it was 80s. And then give me your memories, some of the, the, the memories, and memories <coughs> and some of your memories. Obviously, you know, 86, the Skywalkers was... Probably not a good memory for you at the end, but... Well, but no. But, you know, a lot of people, when they say Starcade, they think of the first one with Flair and Harley, and then they think of 85 with the I Quit match. Yeah. And then obviously 86 with you and the... Well, I'll start out. And okay. with, I'll start out with the first one. The first Starcade in 1983, I had just been a professional in wrestling for a year. I'd been obviously a photographer, a ring announcer before that, but I had been a professional for a year. I was still in the Memphis Territory, and we heard about Thanksgiving night in Greensboro, North Carolina. They did this huge show. Flair and Harley Race for the title. It was on closed circuit. Um, yep. Burp. That's fine. Starting again. In 1983, the first Starcade, I had just been in the business for a year professionally. I was still in the Memphis Territory, but we heard about it. Uh, after the fact, uh, this huge show sold out the Greensboro Coliseum. It was on closed circuit. They did huge business. Uh, all the top stars, you know, it, it were on the card. I thought, wow, this, you know, this could be the start of something, right? And then the next year they followed it up with, uh, with Frazier as referee and another big card. 84, you don't hear as much about, but it still did business, especially in a down period for the rest of the territory. But then, luckily, by the time 85 came around, we were there. Um, we had actually originally, the Midnight Express and I had been supposed to go to the Carolinas for Mid-South Wrestling because Watts had, had told us that we were finishing up after the series of scaffold matches with the Rock and Roll. Well, so we actually had worked with Flair and Dusty in, in Louisiana, and they had both put words in for us with, with Crockett. Obviously, Dusty at that point was the booker, so he didn't need to put a word in, but they both liked us. So we were, we were good on either side of the fence. So we got a starting date in the Carolinas, and that's when Bill Dundee was booking for Watts, called us and said, well, Watts really wants you to go to Dallas. He's made a deal with Fritz. They're going to trade talent, and that way you'll still be close here. We can bring you back for the Superdome. We can bring you back for Oak City and Tulsa, the big events, and plus you'll do great with the Von Erichs. So we went to Dallas, and long story short, because it's not the topic of this documentary, we didn't do great in Dallas. Gino Hernandez, Chris Adams, and One Man Gang pretty much had the Von Erichs all sewed up. We ended up working a six-month program with the Fantastics, which we loved because they were our friends and great matches, but it wasn't the top money. 
At the same time, we had called and given Jimmy Crockett our, our regrets that we couldn't come, and he said, well, if it doesn't work out, you're always welcome. So after six months of not making money in Dallas, uh, we said, yeah, we, we want to come. So we gave our notice there. We called. They brought us into Atlanta. They had just absorbed the Atlanta office, and there was a crew in Atlanta and the main crew in the Carolinas. They brought the Rock and Roll Express in the same weekend, and that's when they won the, the uh, uh, World Tag Team Championship from the Russians their first night in. They were in Charlotte. We were in Atlanta. And the thought was they'll keep us apart for six months. We'll get over here. They'll get over there, and then Dusty will do his thing. Well, Atlanta, they closed down after three months. Uh, so as far as having the guys based in the territory. But with Starcade 85, we were already getting established, but we weren't ready for the rock and roll. So Dusty came up with the, the program with uh, Handsome Jimmy Valiant, the Boogie Woogie Man, and Miss Atlanta Lively. For the people who don't know, it was Ronnie Garvin dressed as a woman. And somehow, Dusty managed to almost make this sound feasible. That <laughs> Ronnie had dressed up as a woman. The first time he, Ronnie's dressed in, in drag in the locker room at, at, at TBS TV. Big wig, huge fake snavitzes, the sweater, the tight pants like the 80s rock video look at the time. Barbarian's over in the corner, way on the other side of the room, looks over and says, Oh, who's the new girl? She looks good. <laughs> We're like, Barb, go up and take a closer look. Anyway, we were not happy, to say the least, that our first Starcade, we were going to, Jimmy Valiant, I mean, I, I'd known him for years at that point from, from wrestling in Memphis, and my mother was even the godmother of his son, Handsome Jr. I was fine with working with Jimmy Valiant, but just... Are the people going to take this seriously? If Ronnie Garvin, yes, but Ronnie Garvin dressed as a woman. Is our big Starcade match going to be? And so this is where I learned to have some faith in what Dusty did because he managed some way to frame this to where they pulled it off. The people actually loved it. Not only that, the Midnight Express got the tuxedos. We all three got tuxedos for the street fight, the Atlanta street fight, because that's the first year that they were in the Omni for half the show and Greensboro for half the show. So, and they back and forth on the closed circuit. So anyway, we come out in tuxedos for a street fight. Ronnie Garvin gets juiced. Now there's a transvestite just covered in blood. I think Jimmy's bleeding. Bobby and Dennis, everybody's bleeding. They're hitting each other with stuff. It, it was a wild brawl, and people went crazy. It got over. It wasn't the greatest technical match we ever had, but it was our intro to Starcade. It was one of the featured matches, and we got a nice payoff out of it. He was kind of the original big mama then. Well, it, well, and actually, no, because Big Mama was actually in the corner, I believe. At the, was, if she wasn't at Starcade, they brought her in on it. But somewhere or another, Big Mama was, was in the corner of Handsome Jimmy, and it was, it was bizarre. It was not, let's put it this way, it probably wasn't something Bill Watts would have booked. That's what we were used to at that point in time, but it worked. And that was Starcade 85, and then Starcade 86 is the one everybody remembers. And it, from a selfish personal standpoint, we had all the great matches with the Rock and Roll Express, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson, Fantastics, all these great tag teams. All of our Starcade matches were all main events and they all drew money and we got our biggest payoffs of our career and they none of them technically <laughs> were as good as what we were doing in Gaffney, South Carolina at a spot show. When you think about what well, we had, a, we had a street fight with, with handsome Jimmy Valiant and, and Ronnie Garvin dressed as a woman. The next year, Starcade 86, the one everybody remembers, we had a scaffold match with the road. We had great matches with the Road Warriors on the ground, but nobody can have a great match up there. So we got our biggest payoff the whole time we worked for Crockett and the most memorable match of all time. And I took the second most memorable bump in wrestling history behind Mick Foley getting tossed off the Hell in a Cell that was replayed over and over. But the matches themselves weren't anything near what we could do in a ring with a straight match quality-wise. So that, that did teach me that match quality and profitability, bankability, drawability don't necessarily go hand in hand. In 1987, we had the Rock and Roll Express, but on a scaffold again, and in Chicago, because that's, 87 had been a down year, and Dusty was reaching to the well again. So he said, well, let's do the scaffold again. So our Starcade 87 match sucked because it was on a scaffold. It wasn't near what we could do with the Rock and Roll. And then Starcade 88, 
was actually the best wrestling match that we had of all of them because it was against the original Midnight Express and, and Pauly Dangerously. But that was the one that nobody saw because Turner Broadcasting had bought the company and pretty much put the boots to it and, and nobody remembers that. Let's talk about 86 a little bit more, everybody. You know, you talk, talk about that bump. <coughs> you're, you're afraid of heights, right? Yes. <laughs> talk about that a little bit because that's, like you said, it's been okay. seen all over the world millions of times. Well, we had been working a program with the Road Warriors and they were scheduled right before Starcade 86 to go to Japan. And to explain the time off, the Midnight Express got to do something that nobody ever got to do, and that's injure the Road Warriors. We attacked them, beat them, they sold my racket, hawk and animal. You know, they, they were so professional working with, with the Midnight because they respected Bobby and Dennis in the ring, and they even respected me, especially after I took that bump, but they, we hurt the Road Warriors, and they were gone to Japan, but they were out of sight. And I'm, where are the Road Warriors? We've run them off. They're gone for good. Then they started sending in videos, and they did the video from up on top of the construction scaffold where they said, we're going to have the Midnight Express where Jim Cornette, who everybody knows is afraid of heights, as Hawk would say, he's a big pussy. <laughs> Cornette can't interfere. He's going to be up on the scaffold 20 feet in the air, Night of the Skywalkers. That was Dusty's addition. There had been scaffold matches, but they'd never been called Skywalkers. And uh, we're going to get the Midnight Express. So basically... Dusty was banking, and rightfully so, as it turned out, on the fact that we had enough heat at that point that people legitimately wanted to see us killed. They wanted to see us die. They threw the pumpkins off of the scaffold, and they crashed. That's supposed to be our heads into a million pieces. And, of course, we heard pumpkin head, pumpkin head for months after that. But people legitimately were hoping, in some cases, that they would pick us up bodily and throw us all off the scaffold, and we would die. And that was the, the name of that tune. So... I've seen scaffold matches because the first one ever was Jerry Jarrett and Don Green here in Louisville in 1971. I was familiar with scaffold matches. We had done them with the rock and roll in, in, uh, in Louisiana. First tag team scaffold matches ever. And I was like, boy, it's going to be tough with Hawk and Animal up there. Well, it got tougher because a lot of people don't know this. In Japan, Hawk broke his leg. He, bro he didn't just break it completely in half, but he broke one of the two lower leg bones and he had a cast on underneath his boot when he went up on that scaffold. So you talk about is Cornette had guts because he took the bump, or the Midnight Express had guts because they took the bump. Hawk went up there, even though he didn't have to take the bump, he went up there with a broken leg. But there was, this was the biggest show of all time. It was the first NWA show that grossed with the, the closed circuit gate and the Omni gate and the Greensboro gate. It grossed a, a million dollars. We knew the scaffold match with the Road Warriors was not going to be a classic match, but the build and the, the hype of the promotion was insane. And the, the event was subtitled Night of the Skywalkers, so we knew we had to come up with something good. Hawk's up there with a broken leg. That made it a little tougher. Then, three days beforehand, every year at Starcade, Dusty would bring everybody into the office and explain what we were going to do so that the guys could think about it. Because normally we'd find out in those days when we showed up at the building what we're doing two hours later. This time we had a couple of days to think about it. Dusty sits us down and he says, okay, the Road Warriors got to win this one, baby. But the Midnight Express top team, main event team. So I don't want to kill the Midnight Express off. So what we're going to do? And he looks at me. He says, after the Midnight Express, Bobby take the bump, Dennis take the bump, Road Warriors win. But then they'll chase you, Cornette, up the scaffold. Now my eyes are getting bigger, right? They chase you up the scaffold, and you run out there in the middle, and there's one on one end and one on the other end, and you ain't got nowhere to go but down. <laughs> so you get down under there, and you hang, and this was the way Dusty presented this to me originally. You hang underneath the scaffold, and down there in the ring is Big Bubba Rogers, six foot six, 350 pounds, and the Midnight Express, and you kick your feet up, Dusty, I'm sorry, I do a terrible Dusty. But you kick your feet up, and you drop, and they catch you like they catch the girls at the cheerleaders at the football games. Oh, God. All right, so I got to go home and think about this for two days. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody. I'm just thinking, I'm going to somehow kick my feet up, and they're going to catch me like they catch the girl cheerleaders at the football games, right? We got to the Omni that night. Me and Bobby and Dennis walk out, and there is that scaffold set up. 
The only tag team scaffold matches that had ever been done were the Midnight and the Rock and Roll Express in Louisiana. We did them in every town, but that was the standard 14-foot scaffold, and, you know, even then it was risky. We looked up at that scaffold. It was three sections, a three eight-foot section. So it was 24 feet from the scaffold to the ground, 21 feet from the scaffold to the ring. And I looked up at that thing, and I said, boys, the University of Alabama football team couldn't catch me. Come, I will kill all of you. And Bubba's even like, oh, and Bubba would do anything. He's like, oh. So <laughs> plan B, we started thinking, I said, look, and I've seen something on TV about the parachute people when they drop and roll, right? I said, all right, Bobby, you're out. Dennis, you're out. Bubba, you get in there. When I'm hanging there, <laughs> when I let go, I will throw my arms out to the sides <laughs> and you get your arms under me when, and when we land, we'll both drop and roll to the left, and you just break my fall a little bit, right? And okay, Jimmy. Then uh, earlier in the night, if you go back and watch the tape, when uh, I was out with Bubba again, his street fight with Ronnie Garvin, and I whack Ronnie Garvin on the head with the racket, and suddenly I drop from out of the view. Well, I had, had heard a crack in my knee. I had partially tore something because it was sudden pain, and I fell down. I got up, and I'm shaking it off. Now I've got to drop off the scaffold. Failure was not an option, and I was not going to not do this. This was the biggest show of all time, and we're the feature match, right? So I'll be a grease spot, whatever, but at least a lot of people will see it. And I talked to Animal, and uh, he, what a tremendous guy. He knew I didn't want to be up there, but he respected what we were doing. I said, when I go down on that scaffold and I reach under and get the, the rungs and I've got a grip on it, if you watch the tape, you can see when he comes over, he grabs my leg because he's strong enough to hold me. I wasn't going to fall on my head till I got under that thing, right? So he's working with me all the way. And, and you could hear me scream, actually, faintly, let go of me, which was his cue to, imagine that, let go of me. I swing underneath there. And I didn't even look when I was up there. I, I, I was doing this, but I wasn't seeing, because if I'd have saw, I wouldn't have been able to do it, right? I'm hanging there, and I'm thinking, okay, now I'm swinging. So I'm trying to, I don't want to swing backwards, so I'm going to time this right. Bobby had dropped like this. He sprained his ankle. Dennis had dropped like this. Landed on both feet and fallen over and kind of sold everything. I let go. It was like a tornado. I heard the wind whistling in my ear. It seemed like I fell forever, but in actuality, if you watch the tape, I defied gravity and fell like that. Bubba's there. As I drop, he lost me in the lights. He, afterward, he said, Jimmy, you fell so fast. <laughs> I land on the knee that I've already done something to. It bent completely sideways the wrong way. I blew the ACL, I tore a bunch of the cartilage, I flew backwards when I landed after that buckled and I landed on my ass, my head flew backwards. I hit the back of my head on Bubba's kneecap, knocking me legitimately unconscious for about 10 to 12 seconds, which kind of served as a natural anesthetic because I didn't immediately feel the incredible pain <laughs> shooting through my leg. I looked down when I got my wits about me and thought I was going to see a bone sticking out, right? But uh, so I'm like, now. Uh, I'm in shock, and my suddenly I sound like Pee Wee Herman on helium or whatever. Bubba, Bubba, carry me. And Bubba's like, Jimmy, that was great. What a great bump. I was like, Bubba, I'm hurt. Carry me. That was great. Bubba, I'm shooting. Help me. He thought he, I said I was shitting, right? He didn't know what to. I said, Bubba, get me the fuck out of here, right? So he gets me out of there, and uh, some way or another, I got in the back and started putting weight on it again, and now I'm in shock. I don't know this, but I am because I've torn everything, but now I can put weight on it. So I borrow a knee sleeve from Sam Houston, get in the car and drive back to the hotel. My wife's waiting. The next day I got up, it was like this. It was huge. It looked like a basketball. I couldn't even hop on the other leg without pain. I had to go. She, she bought me a set of crutches and a pillow, put me in a back seat, and drove me straight to Charlotte, and I went straight to surgery pretty much. And, uh, the, the, but once again, at least, it was the second most famous wrestling bump of all time. And that is the story of Starcade 86. Okay, just wrap up. Well, wrap up Starcade, it was, it was a huge event, blah, blah. And it was, a, it was groundbreaking, just really quick. And then we're going to go <clears> transition <throat> into okay. the bashes. But Starcade 86, like I said, was 
the first million dollar gate in NWA history when you counted everything. It was the first wrestling video that went gold uh, when they sold it on TBS for months and months afterwards. And it was really what made the Midnight Express and myself uh, probably one of the most well-remembered tag teams of the 80s for that one giant moment in time. Okay, let's go and skip back to another thing you can't mention on TBS. Let's talk about how important, how important that was for Crockett to get that. And obviously you got it through events and giving right. him a million, two million, I'm not sure what it was. Million dollars. Goes. Just kind of talk about how, <coughs> how important TBS was and that exposure and how, I imagine once they got that, it was even, it blew up even more than it already had. Yeah. When Crockett Promotions got the TBS time slot, it was, it was earth shaking at that time because obviously Georgia Championship Wrestling in its day had been uh, the highest rated program on WTBS at that time. Ted Turner built the Superstation on Andy Griffith, Braves Baseball and Wrestling. And then through the political manipulations, Vince got control of the time slot, but the fans mutinied because they weren't seeing Gordon Soley, they weren't seeing the southern wrestling they were used to, the great workers, they were seeing WWF canned tapes of WWF style matches that they didn't like. At that time, besides the Northeast, nobody wrestled really that style. So Vince was getting a lot of complaints from TBS for not doing a show in the studio, from, from the complaints that the, the viewers had. And TBS was searching for other programming. Uh, Bill Watts and Mid-South Wrestling got a Sunday afternoon slot for a while and was doing better ratings than, uh, than any of the other programs. He gave Ole a slot for the Georgia office on Saturday morning, Vince had Saturday evening, Watts had Sunday afternoon, and Watts was supposed to get the whole thing. But Crockett slipped in because Vince knew what he was going to do the following March. This was late 84. He knew what he was going to do in March with WrestleMania and he needed money. So Crockett basically paid a million dollars to Vince McMahon Jr. for the time slot on TBS and took it back for the NWA, but Vince used that money to finance WrestleMania, which if it hadn't been a success, we wouldn't be talking about Vince McMahon right now because he would have been done. He was mortgaged to the hilt, but it was a success. That led to the downfall much later. Uh, when Crockett got the time slot, it was a whole, uh, a whole nother world as far as uh, exposure for the guys from the Carolinas and it really was a boon to the business because now that was his key not only the syndication he had great television in the Carolinas but now he could start syndicating wrestling shows or uh, syndicating the television show to other parts of the country and they would already know who the stars were on his local TV because of that Atlanta time slot so TBS was was very important and also it, 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 it started to set up the battle lines. Whereas Vince had the USA Network for the WWF, the NWA had TBS. So it, 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 it induced a level of parity for the fans. Well, those are the Southern guys and they have the really great matches and those are the guys from up North and they have the really great entertainment. I don't know what people were thinking at that point. You know, uh, this was before sports entertainment managed to latch onto our business. Let's go to the Great American Bashers. Obviously, it started out as just a one show. Charlotte <coughs> became this huge tour. People we've talked to said they lost money. It was, it was stupid, but uh, obviously, you guys were drawing big, big money on these things. Just kind of talk about the Bashers. Okay. The first Great American Bash in 1985 was just in Charlotte at the, at the Memorial Stadium. It was Flair and Nikita Koloff, and that was the month that we started with Crockett, so we were not yet, we weren't booked on that show, but it did almost 30,000 people. Flair came in in a helicopter. You know, that, at that time, that amount of people, that amount of money at the gate, that's big business for anybody. So they knew they had something, and it's another Dusty Rhodes brainchild. The next year, when business started out in 1986 so hot, and that's when Flair and Dusty were selling out, Rock and Roll in the Midnight first got together and were selling out, they decided they were gonna go with the Great American Bash on tour. The 86 Great American Bash would be 14 dates in major arenas, some stadiums around the country, and they would have the, the music, they'd have the wrestling, Great American Bash, summertime, hot dogs, apple pie, and wrestling, right? Well, in hindsight, they probably overreached with some of the stadiums. Some of them they didn't. 
Memorial Stadium in Charlotte did great. Um, Veteran Stadium in Philadelphia uh, did a fantastic house. I was standing back there when the show started with Ric Flair, who'd seen a lot of big crowds. And we uh, wrestled every month in Philadelphia at the Civic Center that seated about 11,000 people. And there's no way that this crowd could have fit in the Civic Center. I asked Rick, I said, Rick, how many people you think are out there? He said, that's what he said. <laughs> Hold on one second. If it's not my wife, I'm not going to. Great American Bash, big tour, successful. Right. Money. The um, in Philadelphia, we ran Veterans Stadium. And in Philadelphia, we normally, every month, wrestled at the Civic Center, seated about 11,000 people. And Flair and I were standing out at the back as the show started, looking at the crowd. There's no way that would have fit in the Civic Center. And I asked Rick, who had seen some big crowds, I said, Rick, how many people do you think? He's looking around, he said, I'd say between 17 and 20,000 people. The tickets were $50 floor, $25 in the bleachers. Elliot Murnick, the promoter, came in at the end of the night and we're thinking this house is going to be 400 grand, right? Easy, minimum. $215,000. And right then I thought, okay, they just, they, just, they just paid basically for the whole tour uh, on what they skimmed off of that. I, I, you know, people say it didn't draw well. I was there, I looked at it. No, we didn't fill Veterans Stadium up, but there were a lot of people there and at 50 and 25, the numbers didn't add up on that one. On a lot of the other ones, yeah, they did. Buildings that we normally sold out, but at higher prices, the gate was higher. But still, it wasn't what they hoped it would be. And the guys didn't get paid what we originally thought. We thought 14 Starcades, you know, we're going to make $140,000. Well, we didn't make that, but we still did well compared to what we would have made anywhere else. Um, Cincinnati was a bomb. Riverfront Stadium, it rained all day. Um, George Jones did not draw in Cincinnati. Uh, so there was like 4,000 people there, and I'm sure they lost a fortune. We were, we were putting eight and 10,000 in the Cincinnati Gardens for a regular show. But for every failure, there was also a, a success, and overall, it showed that we were doing big business in major markets and not just in the Carolinas. And I think that was, uh, that was once again, a tribute to, to the talent, to the booking, and just to how hot the program was at that time. Uh, let's talk about the Crockett Cup. Um, okay. I thought it was a neat concept. It only lasted like three years. And yeah. Could you just kind of tell me about that? And I, I have actual photographs of every team that won it, so I'm kind of trying to get somebody. I don't want to feed you a line, but I'm trying to get somebody to just say, you know, the Road Warriors won it the first year, the Superpowers won it, and then I think Sting and Luger won it for five yeah. years. So just kind of, sorry, kind of tell me about the Crockett Cup and maybe just kind okay. of list the winners for me so I can use those. Um, so who I'm trying to remember now? If first year was the Road Warriors, second year was Superpowers, a third year was Luger and Sting. <laughs> yes, um, the first Crockett Cup tag team tournament was in 1986 in New Orleans at the Superdome, and the Midnight Express and I were really looking forward to, to going there because obviously we'd been in the Superdome before for Watts and actually uh, I burped again. Er, I'll start again. Uh, the first Crockett Cup Tag Team Tournament was in 1986 in the Superdome in New Orleans. And the Midnight Express and I were really looking forward to that because we had worked the Superdome a couple of years previously for, for Bill Watts and Mid-South Wrestling. And at the time, the concept for the first one was that all the great tag teams from all the territories would be involved. So you had teams from as far away as the Portland Territory, from world-class Mid-South uh, Watts worked with them as well as all the great NWA teams. So it was really, it was 24 pretty good teams. They had a great depth of, of field there. There was an afternoon event and then the finals in the evening. And that's where we, we uh, started falling into our slot because Dusty always had the Midnight Express generally either get a bye in the first round and then in the second and third rounds, we would always go just far enough to put the, the eventual winners over. Uh, because Dusty thought, well, it's named after Jim Crockett Sr., it's in his honor, it's a big tournament, so good has to triumph in the end. So the first year, the winners were the Road Warriors, and they're the ones that eliminated us. The second year, the Superpowers, and they're the ones that eliminated us. The third year, Luger and Sting, and I think they're the ones that eliminated us. Um, Luger and Sting was actually kind of a, a 
slapped together tag team. They weren't regular, but they were different than the Road Warriors and the Superpowers, and Good had to win in the end. The Superdome did not draw what we would have liked because in the two years since we'd been there where we put 23,000 people in there with our match with Junkyard Dog and, and Bill Watts, Watts's territory had been hurt because of the oil bust in, in the Gulf states down there and the economy and the whole thing had, had gone to shit. But it's still, um, I can't remember what the afternoon was. We can check my book for the dates, but, or for the, for the gates, but uh, the evening was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't what we thought or what we hoped it would be. The next year in Baltimore was tremendous. Uh, we did two nights instead of an afternoon and an evening. We did two nights in a row at the Baltimore Arena. I think it was a Civic Center then, and did a total of over three hundred thousand dollars at the gate. Sold out the second night. Did very good the first night, and then in 1988 it was the Carolina Connection, where the first night was in Greenville, South Carolina, and the finals were in Greensboro, and as I recall, those did quite well also. But it was great tag team matches up and down the card. Great chance for a lot of teams to get exposed, and it was another another case of building and peaking to those quarterly big shows and, and they were all different. Uh, let's talk about the horsemen and what they kind of meant to Crockett. Some people say they were a staple, but I mean, the talent roster there was just tremendous, but a lot of people would say they were kind of, I don't want to say they carried it because all you guys did, but they were kind of. Well, they, they, were, they were, the four horsemen were, were integral to the success for a two or three year period there of, of the NWA Mid-Atlantic Crockett promotions because Dusty was smart enough to realize um, he had some baby faces. Nikita Koloff was, let's face it, nobody ever said Nikita was Luthez in the ring, but he was a personality. Magnum TA was a good athlete, good worker, and was going to get better before his accident. Uh, but he had only been wrestling for three or four years at that point, so he was still green. That was the problem. Um, some of the other top baby faces that could draw money needed that antagonist, needed that heel that was a great worker that could have a match with anybody, and that's where the horsemen came in. And really, it was just an accident. It, you know, it was the old uh, mid-Atlantic wrestling way to have a lot of the baby faces or a lot of the heels out at the end of the program to cut a promo on all the things that they were doing just to close the show with star power. And one day in Atlanta, it was Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson, Ric Flair, and Tully Blanchard, and J.J. Dillon, who was Tully's manager. And they were all out as a group, and Arn held up the fingers and said, not since the four horsemen of the apocalypse have four men caused this much damage. It was like Austin 316. He came up with that. It was just something he said on an interview, and the next day the building was full of Austin 316 signs. The Four Horsemen, the people got it. They were starting to get some heel fans in the, in the studio at that point, and they started coming dressed in the suits and ties. And, the, you know, Ole never dressed a suit and tie in his life, but Tully did, Flair did, Arn would pick it up a little bit, and, uh, and they, they were great. They could wrestle anybody, tag team or single combinations, four completely different talents, but they worked well together and they got, all got along well together. And J.J. Uh, was a top manager uh, from, you know, with a great history. So it was main event level guys banding together saying they were better than everybody else. And then anytime you had a baby face, he could just bump right off of them. And, you know, there you go. And then you mentioned, you know, being the team, the four, the four guys with J.J. They had the war games. That was kind of a, I thought it was a neat concept. I think people still would love to see that match. Why, I mean, Dusty has a trademark on that or something? Is that why they don't do it anymore? No, well. We just, well, don't, who cares? Okay. Well, it, actually, the war games, <clears throat> a lot of people don't know that the war games, I, I, I'll, I'll start a, a better sentence. The war games morphed through a little something I had to do with it into Hell in a Cell because the War Games originally was Dusty's concept, two rings, a cage over both with a roof, the staggered entrance, and then submission or surrender. And the, very, the first famous spot, they're building a dome of steel in Atlanta. That was so cool back then. People didn't do that stuff then in wrestling. Um, and it, it, was, it was a classic blow off War Games match to, you know, to settle the ultimate grudge. I loved that. I don't know why they stopped doing it. But later on, uh, when I was involved with the WWF on the creative committee, 
I remembered how great that was, and I also remembered the, the, the big cage that they used to have in Memphis that went all the way around ringside so that you could fight around the ring and etc. And when they were looking for a new twist on something for uh, uh, Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, I said, how about we take the best of all of these things? You get a cage that goes around the ring area so they can fight around the side, but also it's got a top on it like the war games, and you can't get in, can't get out because the WWF cages had been so spoiled and prostituted because the idea of a cage match was to, in the WWF was to climb out of the cage, which made no earthly sense whatsoever. So it was a great concept that Dusty had and the staggered entrance. And, you know, it, part of it, concepts of it have been ripped off for different, you know, matches. And now they've got the elimination chamber and et cetera. But to me, the war games was the perfect balance between cool enough, but not just hokey you know, with sliding panels and triple towers and plexiglass and everything. The war games was just cool and people got off on it and you didn't overdo it. You didn't beat it to death. It, it didn't happen that often. So when it did, it was special. Um, but the war games uh, with, with the horsemen was a natural, but then later on they were able to branch out and, and you know, do different combinations of teams. WCW fucked that up. Yeah. Gordon yeah. Flair, but... Uh, oh, and let me, uh, one more thing about the horsemen. Um, the original set of horsemen with Ole was probably the best in the ring. Ole, Arn, Tully, Flair. Then when Luger came along, when Ole was, was phasing out wrestling, they knew Luger was green. They wanted to give him the star rub, with being surrounded by all these guys that could work, even though he was green, hopefully the idea was he'd come along. And a lot of people remember the Luger version. Then actually, when, when Luger was, uh, was dropped for Barry Windham, that was really the best working team in, in the ring amongst all the horsemen groups. But at that point in 87 or so, that's when business was starting to take a slide down. So they're not remembered as much as the originals are because business was so much bigger when, when it first got together. Uh, you mentioned Magnum a little bit. I think you guys were there uh, when he had his accident. Yep. They passed us on the way home from Greenville. Well, just tell me about that. You don't have to go too in depth. Just kind of tell me about what you thought when you heard it happen and you know obviously his career ended just kind of talk a little bit about that and then then having Nikita transfer transform into uh, Dusty's partner and what that was kind of like because I, <coughs> I guess nobody knew about that <coughs> no nobody knew talk, talk about that and then um when Magnum TA had his accident we were on the way back from Greenville South Carolina just like we were every Monday night of our lives and it, the weather was not great. And I remember seeing Magnum and Dusty pass us on the interstate. And then I got home and got up the next day and it's all over television, all over the newspaper. Uh, at this point in 1986, business was at its strongest and Magnum TA suffering a car accident like that was front page news. Not only front page news in the paper, not only all over television, but the switchboard at the hospital had to be shut down. There were fans camping out. This was a major celebrity that had suffered a terrible accident. And we didn't obviously know the extent of his injuries right off the bat, but we, th you know, this could happen to anybody at any time. It, you know, it, it, we all were in the car way too much. So that disturbed everybody at first, but also, you know, we knew that Magnum was going to be the world champion probably sooner than later. He was going to be a big star. He already was. Um, you know, what kind of effect was he going to be able to come back from this? We were all hoping for the, you know, the miracle recovery and obviously it didn't come. And that, you know, that was one of the biggest losses to me of wrestling in the eighties was how much, how much better he only wrestled maybe four, maybe five years. How much better would he have gotten? How much bigger would he have gotten? Was he the guy that was going to carry the NWA? Everybody thought he was, but, uh, we never got a chance to find out. And just that showed us all kind of, you know, our mortality, but also it showed us the, the connection that wrestlers had with the fans in the Carolinas that people would go out of their way to go to the hospital to send flowers. I mean, it was like the president, you know, had, had suffered an accident. It, it, it showed us how big we were and how small we were at the same time. But the show has to go on. When this is not the first time this was done in wrestling, when Whitey Caldwell, the biggest baby face in the history of East Tennessee, was killed in a car wreck in 1972, his place was taken that Friday night at the matches in Knoxville by the guy he'd waged a 15-year war with, 
Ron Wright, the number one hillbilly, the hottest heel ever in East Tennessee, because that was what was right. I'm doing it for Whitey. Well, in this case, Dusty put a twist on it in that the evil Russian, the communist menace, Nikita Koloff, the guy who had, you know, who had, uh, had went to war with Magnum, Russia versus the U.S., uh, he came out because of his respect for Magnum and for the respect that he'd gained for him in the ring. He came out and took his place and was instantly over. And nobody knew it was going to happen. When he came out, we were watching the monitor back in the locker room. And, oh, okay, now we see. You know, and, and it, it, that's what made Nikita. Nikita was big as far as his tag team with, with Uncle Ivan and Crusher Khrushchev, but Nikita went to a whole nother level just by being put in that spot, and it was because of the, the catalyst of Magnum. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, people say Starcade 87 and uh, I think Bunkhouse, Bunkhouse Stampede up in New York. Yes. Were stupid <clears throat> Cost a lot of money to move all the guys up there, the equipment up there. And <coughs> well, and obviously, arcade in Chicago with Flair and then the car. You could have booked Jesus Christ versus Moses in a Texas death match in Chicago for Starcade, and people still wouldn't have liked it because it wasn't Starcade if it wasn't in Greensboro, and they had. They'd taken half to Atlanta, and that was still okay because Greensboro was involved, and it was a it was a big deal. But the thought behind it was that now that Crockett has has bought out Mid South Wrestling and bought out the Kansas City territory and bought out the Florida territory and is assembling the wrestling network to compete with Vince McMahon, who's ever heard of Greensboro? Greensboro, where's that? We need to be in a big media center. And we had had a run in Chicago at the UIC Pavilion, seated 10,000 people, where I think seven or eight shows in a row, seven, eight months in a row, sold out. It was a, it was, Chicago was a great wrestling town. Chicago was a hot crowd. Nothing wrong with Chicago. But to take Starcade, which was born and raised in Greensboro, which the Carolinas fans looked at as theirs, and put it in Chicago, people in Greensboro and around the Carolinas never forgave Crockett Promotions for that. And also, we didn't get any extra media from being in Chicago than being in Greensboro. What we got was, instead of Starcade 86 being in a 16,000 seat building and selling out to do 300 grand, and in the annex, the Coliseum annex, closed circuit did another 70 grand, and another three or 4,000 people, there were 20,000 people in Greensboro, paid almost $400,000. Chicago, <clears throat> Chicago sold out at 10,000 people and paid $180,000. That don't add up. The pay-per-view is going to carry the day. Well, the pay-per-view got sabotaged by the first Survivor Series because Vince was seeing, hey, they're doing numbers, and i got to do something to block this. So because of the success of WrestleMania, he went to the cable companies and said, if you carry them, you can't carry my shows. Well, like he's going to just take WrestleMania off the air if they'd all go told him to piss up a rope. But they did it because Crockett Promotions was not proven on pay-per-view yet. So as a result, we lost the, the pay-per-view, five people. The, the, the cable company in Charlotte carried Starcade 87 or I wouldn't have a tape of it. Um, I think two or three other cable systems in the Carolinas carried Starcade 87 and one in California because the guy had given his word and he wasn't going to go back on his word. So five, six cable systems carried Starcade 87, the rest of them didn't. So we lost the pay-per-view revenue and we lost a couple hundred grand off the gate that we would have had in Greensboro for no additional media. And that was the beginning of the end. Not learning the lesson, went to the Bunkhouse Stampede pay-per-view in New York. The Vince's backyard, just like when he came to, to the Carolinas, he didn't draw 15 cents in Chinese money while Crockett was still promoting because that wasn't our wrestling, that's that Yankee wrestling that we don't like. But we go to New York, the seat of the WWF for the previous, you know, 40 years, they didn't really care about us either. Plus, we couldn't get into Madison Square Garden. We were at the Nassau Coliseum. I've been on WWF shows in the Nassau Coliseum. Those people uh, act like you held a gun on them to come in anyway. So it was a bad atmosphere, it was a short pay-per-view, it was ill-conceived and ill-thought-out, 
It was not good. That's, that was what started the tipping point. And also from, from summer of 87, right after the bashes. And by the way, the 87 bashes, they did more shows than 86, just didn't go to the stadiums, and they did good business too. But then from the middle of 87 after the bashes until the spring of 88, through one method or another, we had nobody to work with. We were supposed to do a program with the new breed, but they had a car accident. Talent was in a state of flux. Business was not good. That's when the 88 bashes came around. The talk was already about selling to TBS, which I'll tell you the story about the bookkeeper in a second. But before the 88 bashes, it had been nine months of, of drought, and the talk was already of selling to TBS. But the 88 bashes turned out to be tremendously successful. 40 shows in 45 days all across the country from California to New York to Florida. Incredible schedule. We literally worked counting TV tapings. I think I've, it's in my book, but we had something like 50 something matches in 40 days. Um, we had three days off in that whole period of time. It was just, it was, it was a ball buster of a tour, but the gates were, were good. And as a matter of fact, David Crockett, from what I understand, went to Jimmy and said, wait, business is coming back. Should we sell? But it was, it was too late then. It was already in the pipeline. They were too far in the hole. Have you ever heard the story of how Crockett found out he was $2 million down? No, let's do that, let's do that later. <laughs> okay. I won't get ahead of you. I got a couple more topics because you keep mentioning uh, Bill Watts. And everybody knows he bought <clears throat> the UWF at yeah. the time and brought all the talent in and kind of shit on them. And uh, just kind of talk about that. A lot of people say he didn't even need to buy him because of the TV he had already. He didn't really need to even go in there and buy him. Could have just went in there anyway. <clears throat> and just kind of talk about. Well, the, he, here we go. You, you, you tell me. I'm just kind of. <laughs> well, I know people say that, but here was what was being planned. Crockett had been advised that the way to compete with Vince, since now all of a sudden the mid-80s were in this wrestling boom, the way to compete with Vince is commercial time on television, national sponsors. He's making money on dolls and ice cream bars and all this merchandise, and he's also he's, he's making money on advertising. The thought was that if Crockett assembled the WWN, the wrestling network, whatever, that he would be able to sell national ad time to all these potential advertisers. So to do that, at the same time, the, the territories that weren't funded as well were having trouble. Eddie Graham had, had committed suicide in 1985 and Florida was struggling. Great territory with key television stations in key markets that had been there forever, the key times people were used to watching. Kansas City, their territory had never been a big money territory. It was, it was rough, but I think Dusty saw that as an early developmental territory. He could send people there to get good because what difference did it make? With the UWF, Watts had seen uh, the, the growth of syndicated television and wanted to get in on the game. And his product uh, inside the ring was good enough to compete with the other guys. And Jim Ross did a tremendous job lining up like a hundred stations across the country that were carrying UWF programming. But at the same time, that was when the oil bust came, the economy in the core cities, Houston, the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, et cetera, was, was in the shitter. So his core territory business went down and it wasn't able to support this expansion and it was not going to succeed. So at the time, Watts you know, said, I'm, I'm going to get out of this uh, and had JR work out a deal to sell the company to Jim Crockett. What Crockett was going to get out of it was an office that Watts already had in Dallas, a physical office that he already had, but he was also going to get in one fell swoop all those clearances on all those broadcast stations across the country, including the core uh, cities in the Mid-South Territory where people were used to watching wrestling on those stations and those time slots for years, and Watts in his own territory was doing moon landing ratings in some of the markets, 20s and 30s place like New Orleans and Houston and Baton Rouge, et cetera, et cetera. So the, I think the price was supposed to be $4 million. I think Watts got half of it eventually because it was some up front and some paid over time. But it looked like a good deal at the time because now Crockett had a syndicated network with Florida, with the Carolinas, with UWF and Kansas City that 
rivaled and even outnumbered Vince McMahon's. What he didn't have <laughs> was the office, was the, the business structure to support all of this. And, 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 and it turned out, as even Vince found out, you couldn't make as much money selling advertising on television as all these advisors said you could, and Crockett was a second one in, and, and it didn't come. It didn't materialize. So all of a sudden, he had a lot of TV stations. He had to produce a lot of programming for. Everything became a TV taping. We weren't running house shows anymore, hardly at all, because everything was shot because you had to, you had to fill this commitment for these stations, this commitment for these stations. The same producer, the Wrestling Network, was sometimes airing five and six different wrestling programs in the same market because of all this television they got. How do you fill that up? How do you, and, and still, you know, and it's all spread out all over the country. It just, it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, you mentioned the office, in, the office in Dallas. I heard Flair had said that they were going to go out there to get into the movie business. I don't know if you have heard that or. Well, we were on. Truth. We were on Crockett's plane one time and Dusty said, boys, pretty soon we're going to be making major motion pictures and sitcoms. Yeah, there was talk of getting in the movie. There was talk of everything. You know, I just, I still just then, like now, just wanted to be in the wrestling business. But the Dallas office was a major media center. Major, once again, ever, they almost gave him penis envy about the Carolinas. The Carolinas per capita drew better crowds for wrestling than anywhere in the country for the size of those cities. But they, they almost like, oh, we can't worry about the Carolinas. We've got to be in Dallas or Los Angeles or New York. And that, that's the problem is, and then at one point, Jimmy moved out uh, to Dallas, I think just to get away from the rest of the family because they were mad at him for selling the company when business had turned around right before the sale. Um, <laughs> but it, the, the other problem with the UWF, was it in Florida, Florida at the time didn't have talent that could really compare to the Carolinas. Neither did Kansas City. The UWF had some heavy hitters. Uh, Dr. Death Steve Williams, the Freebirds, et cetera. Um, you know, those guys could have made a difference, but I don't know that Dusty did it on purpose. And I've been in a position where you do things sometimes you don't really mean to do just because you have to do, and I wasn't privy to the talks. But the UWF was, guys were not made comparable uh, to, to, the, to the Carolina crew. And, and so the dream matches and Super Bowls and things like that didn't materialize because there wasn't that level of parity. Yeah, he went on record as saying back then he wasn't thinking in a war with UWF Crockett because he was too busy worrying about competing with Vince. Yeah. He said it was his, his mistake. But uh, I think the only talent, in, from my opinion, is that really – came out of the UWF was Sting to really make a mark with the Crockett promotion and you know they had the yeah. classic match with Flair on the first clash of the champions. Just kind of talk about that. Didn't you guys, wasn't that against WrestleMania 4? Um, yes. <coughs> Give me that story and just kind of how that match kind of made Sting for the, and a star for the Crockett's. Yeah. The, uh, the first clash of champions in March of 1988 was the first live TBS special uh, and and in those days, you didn't get main event matches on the television programs, and they weren't live. This was both. It was a, a big house show event, broadcast live, and it did a great rating. Uh, people would kill probably for the rating today that it got then. And everybody remembers, of course, we had the match, the midnight with the Fantastics, where we had 12 minutes, so we just went and tore everything apart that we could in 12 minutes and, and had a very memorable match. And then, as usual, we always tried to steal a show. On any show that we were on, we always tried to steal a show, and then Flair would come out and steal it back. Um, and so he had the, the match with Sting. It was supposed to go 60, but some of the undercard went over, and so they decided to go 45. Sting had never gone 45 minutes before, and this was literally two years before this, three years before this, uh, two and a half years. I'll, I'll just start again so I can get it straight. Two years before that Clash of Champions match that Sting had with Flair, I had seen Sting for the first time along with Ultimate Warrior. I came home to visit in Louisville and they were working in the Memphis territory. It was our first territory, the Blade Runners. And all the guys flooded the, the, uh, the curtain to watch the match. And I said, well, is it gonna be that good? And they said, no, it's gonna be that bad. Watch these guys. They looked, Sting and Warrior looked like cartoons come to life because they were so big and so jacked up 
and it was they were against Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee who could both have a match with anybody and it was the worst match I had ever seen up to that point in time. People were laughing. This was back before fans laughed at, at people, but they were that bad. Two years later, the Ultimate Warrior was still that bad, but Sting had gone to, to Mid-South, learned under the learning tree of Bill Watts, uh, been with Eddie Gilbert, who I'm sure got his ear quite a bit, and now was on a big stage against Ric Flair for the world title. And Flair, and Sting will tell you, Flair called that match and carried him through it and made a star out of Sting in one night in a huge rating, big audience, great match that people remember, and that put Sting on the map. And that also put the Clash of Champions on the map. It did so well, they ended up doing specials every three months. And uh, that's why I remember another, <laughs> another Clash of Champions about a year later, Flair had a match with Luger. And it was probably the worst, I think it was from, might have been Corpus Christi, but it was the worst Clash of Champions, worst show I've ever seen, really, uh, at that point in time. And the next day, Flair at the airport said, What'd you think? I said, Rick, you stole the show. And he started to smile, and I said, but it was petty theft. <laughs> His match was good. Everything else, not so much. All right. When did it start going wrong? I mean, people want to say Crockett, <laughs> they always want to focus on it going out of business. Obviously, it was a huge, successful promotion, but obviously they made mistakes. In your opinion, what were the mistakes that they made? And then I'll, that story that you <clears throat> I'll tell you exactly what the mistakes were. The true story of, and people like to blame Dusty and the Dusty finish, and people like to blame this and that. Here's what happened. You can't be hot forever. 86 was hot. The first part of 87 was hot. I remember a sellout in February in Greensboro, 15,000 plus people for Ric Flair and Barry Windham in February of 87. But then right after the bashes, things slowed down. A variety of talent issues, too many finishes, things going wrong, this and that, the other thing. But business always slows down. But this was at the same time where they were buying Kansas City. They were buying Florida. They were buying the UWF. Have to go to a major media center. Have to be recognized. Have to chase Vince. Crockett had been led to believe that all this ad revenue was going to come in from the syndicated television. They didn't have the business structure that Vince had in New York set up. They had an accountant. Have you ever heard the name Dave Johnson? Yes, but we, I don't want to say his name because I'll okay. slander. And... It ain't slander. It's a fucking truth. Fuck you, Dave. I'd still be working there if it wasn't for you. All right. Anyway. For our end. For, for your end, yeah. One day, they, they had bought, first they bought the one plane, then they bought the two planes. And once again, Dusty like, Dusty's like Jackie Gleason to me. Man, and I admire Jackie Gleason. I'm reading a book about him now. Dusty's the great one. Dusty, he's, he's, he drew big, he spent big, he did everything big. Big shows, big promotions. He liked to think big. Major motion pictures and sitcoms. But it wasn't Dusty Rhodes' fault because he was working for Jim Crockett. Right? So if Jim Crockett let Dusty book things that were too expensive, that's not Dusty's fault. I don't know that it was Dusty's idea that he came up with that they should buy every territory in wrestling, but the biggest problem was while they had now bought three or four territories and had national television and airplanes and everything, they still had the same business structure at 421 Briar Bend Drive with the same three secretaries and most importantly the same accountant that they had had when they were Jim Crockett promotions running North and South Carolina and Virginia. And this unnamed accountant was told one day they, they wanted to buy something. I don't remember what it was. See where we're going to get the money to buy this, that, and the other thing, right? He's so far behind, he's so in the weeds, it, it, all this new stuff and, and the television money doesn't come in, the pay-per-view money takes six months or whatever. He's lost, but he didn't tell anybody. And Sandy Scott, whose office sat right here across from Jimmy Crockett's and Dusty Rhodes's, was in the office on Briar Bend one day when he saw Jimmy Crockett walk into day... <laughs> Shit. It's okay. <laughs> Sandy Scott, whose office was right here across from Dusty Rhodes's and Jimmy Crockett's, was in his office one day and saw Jimmy Crockett walk into the accountant's office because the accountant had worked all weekend to figure out where they were going to get this money. And he's in there about five minutes and then he comes out and Sandy said his face was white. He had just found out that not only did they not have the money to buy whatever it was they were going to buy, but they were $2 million in the hole. 
They didn't know they were in the hole until they were $2 million in the hole because the accountant was so far behind. I will stop now because my wife is coming home with the, uh, the garage door. Yeah, I thought we were going to eat. No. <laughs> um, so obviously, the, the several months of, of down business, at the same time that they had bought all these companies, expanded the television, bought airplanes, etc., it, you know, Dusty didn't sign the, the uh, bill of sale on the airplane. Of course, he did name them Stardust and, you know, whatever. But it was just, it was trying to chase Vince instead of taking care of their own business and growing too far too fast. And the core cities couldn't support the expansion. And the TV didn't, TV ad revenue money didn't come in. The pay-per-view was blocked by Vince. It was a series of bad breaks. Now, Dusty may have contributed to... Uh, the bottom line as far as booking expensive cards and expensive talent or just being big, but ultimately whose responsibility, whose shoulders does that responsibility fall on when he wasn't the owner of the company and he wasn't the boss and somebody could have said no or Jimmy Crockett didn't know either. Maybe he should have got a new accountant or several of them because that's the one thing. I've often disagreed with the way Vince McMahon presents the wrestling business but in his office, everybody that he has working on the business side knows what they're doing. And that was the big difference. It wasn't the in-ring product. It wasn't even Dusty Rhodes' booking. And everybody gets over finishes. It was all of a sudden, hey, you're $2 million down. And business ain't too good right now. What are we going to do? The talk started with TBS because TBS didn't want to lose that high-rated programming. Then the Great American Bash 88 came around and all of a sudden Dusty had peaked everything to where things were going to click and things were going to blow off at the bashes and those gates were tremendously up and we were doing big business again, especially even in new markets in the summer of 88 and then followed that up with business getting even bigger in September because that was when the match they'd never seen, uh, Tully and Arn versus the Midnight Express and Flair versus Luger in the 88 Bash rematches started going around the horn. So we did better in Richmond in September. Richmond, Virginia did $120-something thousand dollars, I think, whereas it had only done $100,000 for the Great American Bash. Unheard of, houses were getting better after the bashes. And that's when everybody was like, Jimmy, are we still going to sell? David Crockett, I'm sure, was like, eh. It was too late at that point. You're, you're, in, you're in the locker room. You hear the rumors, hey, we're going to have to sell. What's like? Well, at that point, we, I was, we were happy. Here's the thing. Oops, I almost I stepped on the... In spring of 88, we had been under contract with Crockett since 86 for $100,000 a year minimum for each of us, me and Bobby and then first Dennis, then Stan. And we always made more than that. That was a minimum, so we didn't you know, we didn't worry about it. But then as the last of 87 when business had slacked off and all of a sudden we were making Gaffney and Chesterfield, South Carolina instead of being in Chicago because we didn't have a program. We didn't have anything hot, anybody to wrestle. Um, it continued that way the first part of 88 and that's when we talked Dusty into bringing in the Fantastics, Bobby Fulton, Tommy Rogers, because we said if business is going to be down, at least we need to have some great matches and have some fun. And these guys, with the exception of the Rock and Roll Express, are the best in-ring babyface tag team in the business. Please bring them in. I gave uh, Dusty some ideas for what we could do. We put them over their first night in, you know, gave them credibility as much as we could, and the matches were off the charts. They were really, technically, they were better than our matches with the Rock and Roll. Gate-wise, different story. Now we needed to do something about our money because we were getting paid on the houses. See, we had a, we had a minimum guarantee, but... It was a balloon payment at the end of the year. If you hadn't made your guarantee, they'd make it up to you all in one fell swoop. Did you want to jump yeah, in on something? Well, you mentioned a guarantee. Uh, somebody said that the, they sort of hand out contracts to some of the top guys, <coughs> and they said that was another reason they might have went into the hole. <coughs> well, no. That, well, that's because the, the people that said that didn't have the contracts, because I'm about to tell you how it really worked. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so it wasn't the contracts that... It was, it was the guys jealous they didn't get the contracts. Here's what happened. The contracts that we had been signed to in 1986 that all the Crockett talent were signed to were 
minimum guarantees. You're going to make 50 grand a year minimum, 100 grand a year, whatever the case was. But you weren't paid in regular increments. You were paid on the houses. And at the end of the year, if you had not made your minimum, they would make it up to you in a balloon payment. We had been on 100 grand a year piece since 1986 when they first started signing contracts to make sure nobody went to work for Vents. We always made well over that. So there was no reason to even worry about a balloon payment at the end. But then, as business had gone down, 80, 87, 88, first we got the Fantastics in, now we've got some leverage. We're going out, we're tearing the house down every night, we've got a great team to work with, now we've got to renegotiate our deal. Because, to be quite honest, we, sometimes we were making eight, nine hundred dollars a week, going to these spot shows that weren't drawing very well, not being figured in. That wasn't going to fly for too much longer. So it was probably about March or April that we went in to talk to Jimmy Crockett and said, hey, it's not our fault. You know, we've been with you. We've drawn money. We don't have anybody to work with. Now we've got the Fantastics, but we need something. Give us something. That's when he was still under the impression that all this te television and pay-per-view money was going to come in. And he told us at that time, well, I was actually going to renegotiate with you guys because I want to get everybody tied up because we're going to have this Sunday main event on TBS where we're going to pay like a main event house show. We've got pay-per-view money coming in, television ad revenue money coming in. You guys are going to do really well. You're figured in. Okay, well, so what are we going to do? I, I don't really, I don't have down uh, what we had you figured at. Well, we'll come back when you do have it, right? So we come back the next week, have another meeting, me and Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane. And uh, nobody would throw out a figure first. And finally, just to be a smart ass, I said, well, geez, Jimmy, it sounds to me like we're going to make $250,000 a piece next year. We had you down at two hundred. dollars this face, right? <laughs> okay, I said, well, hell, let's just split the difference and say 225. And he said, yes. I was being a smart ass, right? Just to get something going, all of a sudden he has offered us $225,000 a year guaranteed apiece. Besides for, I believe, the Road Warriors, I don't know what Flair and Dusty were doing, but that was chump change for them at that point in time anyway. We were the first ones to renegotiate, even before Tully and Arn. So basically, we, without delay, got them to draw this paperwork up, and we went in and signed our contracts that said we were going to make, for that calendar year, that next... We're going to say what happened, uh, how will you remember it, how should the fans remember Crockett okay. Promotions, and then you can tell us, don't go way, way in depth, but you kind of talk about rock and roll. The rock and roll. The rock and roll express <clears throat> Let me do the rock and roll a little bit, <clears throat> and then we'll do the wrap-up. But it, well, that just started in Mid-South, right? But you... Yeah. They, they started in Memphis, but I think where I guess you saw them for the first time. Yeah. But, uh, you, you Burp. I'm going to get all the burping out. Um, the Rock and Roll Express as a team started in Memphis, uh, and they were actually the second banana team to the fabulous one, Stan Lane and Steve Kern, because the fabs in Memphis in that territory were so over and drawn so big that business, they were running two towns a night, and they needed another team. And this was right as MTV had come on the air, 1982. Lawler, Jimmy Hart, they both take credit for it. Whichever one was the case, they put Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson together, uh, put the bandanas on them, the Rock and Roll Express, and they were the B-team tag team. But when Watts, his business was down in Mid-South, and Watts came to Memphis to try to look for some new talent. At the same time, uh, this was the end of 83. Uh, Memphis, after having a great summer where they drew 8,000 people minimum for five months in a row every Monday night in the Mid-South Coliseum, Lawler was booking and there were 45 guys in the territory and Jerry Jarrett wanted to pare down the cards. So the thought was that uh, Watts can get some new talent from Jerry Jarrett and Jarrett can get a few new talents from Bill Watts and get rid of some people he wasn't using. The people they weren't using in Memphis that Watts was interested in were Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson, Terry Taylor, myself, and Bill Dundee uh, as a booker, which is pretty good talent. Of course, I wasn't then, but I, I got to be. So that's the only time I've ever known anybody to get the better of Jerry Jarrett in a business deal because uh, Watts proceeded to have a record year for business in 1984. and. The guys that Jerry Jarrett got were Jim Neidhart, Rick Rude before he was Rick Rude, and a couple of other people that didn't do very good at all. 
But the Rock and Roll Express and Bob Eaton and Dennis Condry weren't a tag team and I wasn't managing them. But Watts saw that. He said, these guys would be good together. So the Rock and Roll and Midnight got started in Louisiana and we set a number of gate records there with them because it was, it was perfect. Yin and Yang, the protagonist and the antagonist, the mirror image, teams, every one of them could work their ass off. They could have great matches that the people in Mid-South especially weren't used to seeing because they were used to big ex-football players and big heels and big guys. And along came the Rock and Roll Express and just lit the place up and the women loved them. And the crowds were 60%, 70% female. And I mean, literally, just the Rock and Roll Express's cast-offs for the night in Houston would have made anybody else great sex life for a year. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. They were rock stars. And so when the Rock and Roll in Midnight got on the map in, in Louisiana and that territory, naturally, Dusty wanted to do the same thing in the Carolinas. <clears throat> When we first started in uh, working for Crockett, Dusty kept us apart. And he said, he told everybody, he had a meeting, Midnight Express are going to be my new top heel team. They ain't going to lose nobody, nowhere. You ain't going to beat them. We even won battle royals. Bobby and Dennis, the heels, would win a battle royal and split the money. It was that, you know, that good of a push. And at the same time, he blew the Rock and Roll Express over in one night beating the Russians for the, for the world tag team title. So finally... In January 1986, it was time, it had been six months, it's time to pull the trigger and get to rock and roll and midnight together. And we started doing the first couple of things on television and I'll never forget that the first, uh, February 2nd, 1986, I believe it was, you can check my book, the first match between the Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express in Charlotte. There was a big show in Toronto and Crockett was sending talent to Toronto for the Tunnies at that time. So Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, and the Road Warriors were in Toronto at the same time as we were in uh, Charlotte on top in the main event without all these big stars. The first sellout of the Charlotte Coliseum, legitimate sellout since 1978 in Ric Flair and Blackjack Mulligan. $102,000, 12,000 people. And... As soon as we saw that, we're like, oh my God, this is going to be big, obviously. And then, of course, there was a story that Dusty came back and said, nobody sells out of Charlotte without Dusty Rose on the card. And so the next time, like three or four weeks later, Dusty was on the card, so was Flair, so was the Road Warriors, but we were back with the Rock and Roll, sold out again. Another 102,000, another 12,000 people. Then the next show was like a couple of weeks later on a Sunday afternoon. It was the Rock and Roll at midnight, I think, two out of three falls and a full card. Did like another 80 grand. And then we came back like another five weeks later with the rock and roll and midnight with me hung in the cage and flare against Dusty and not only sold out the Coliseum in Charlotte, another $102,000, another 12,000 people, but they actually closed circuited the thing down the street to the Park Center and down to Spartanburg. So that regular house show was seen in three different places and grow, basically in, in a period of less than 12 weeks in Charlotte, Four shows did 36,000 people and about $400,000 at the gate in 1986. And that was before Charlotte was Charlotte, like today. That was, the, there was, that was the professional sport in town. There wasn't any NBA, there wasn't anything except wrestling. And that was the kind of money that they were doing, and that really kicked off. Now everybody in the country wanted to see the Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express, and it was perfect. It, everybody, a lot of people dog Robert Gibson because Ricky Morton was so good, right? Ricky Morton could sell better than anybody in the business. When you were kicking the shit out of him, I literally, I would, see, I would look out and I would see girls crying. Ricky, when sweat was coming down his face and he was getting beat up, and especially if he was bleeding, and he would reach out to the front row and he'd mouth the words, help me, help me, and they would try. I'm, I've got my back to the ring. I couldn't watch most of the matches because the people are coming over the rail and I'm whacking them with the racket. Ricky could sell his ass off. Everything, his timing was perfect. Everything was perfect. But Robert Gibson, especially in those days before back injuries caught up with him and, and both he and his brother, Ricky Gibson, his original tag team partner, had problems with back and knee injuries. But he was sleek. He was fast as a greyhound. He was lightning quick. He could take these incredible cartwheel bumps over the top rope. They did the double drop kick with great timing. Robert was every step of the way right there with Ricky during the heyday. 
And so now, you know, people dog Robert, but he was part of the team. It was an equal effort. But Ricky, you know, just he naturally, because of the way he could sell, he naturally got most of the attention. And then it was perfect because Bobby Eaton, a guy who took bumps and came off the top rope and did things in the ring at that time that nobody else was doing. And Dennis Condry, probably of the four of them, the best worker. He didn't do anything spectacularly. He did everything well. His body language, his timing, the, the sharpness of, of his work in the ring, the moves that he did. Dennis was different. Nobody has ever copied Dennis's style. I don't think you could. It just... He was built a certain way that he could do certain things, but together it was just magic. And all I had to do was cut the promo and tell the people they were going to see the greatest tag team match they'd ever seen in their life, and then the guys would get in the ring and they'd have it. Because if, if they weren't having the greatest match that I was promising the people uh, night after night, then pretty soon people would have seen through it, but they carried it off. So the Midnight in the Rock and Roll against each other in the 80s probably drew more money or at least more people to the gate. I know tickets now, you know, 25 years later are a whole lot more, so you can draw more money, but the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express drew more people to the gate than any tag team rivalry, certainly in the 80s, maybe of all time. How does that make you feel being a part of that? I mean, people say those are some of the greatest tag matches ever and still talk about them to this day. How does it make you feel to be a part of them? As the biggest wrestling fan in the room, I got the best seat in the house and I got to stand there at ringside and watch them all every single night. So, I, you know, that was, we took pride in what we were doing. And that, that's one of the reasons why the, the midnight, we, we never went to the WWF. We had the meetings, we had a couple of offers, but we knew that with their style, I wasn't going to get two or three minutes every week on TV to talk. They weren't going to get 20 minutes every night to tear the house down in the ring. And we took pride in that, and we were making money, and we were living where we wanted to live, and we were working with friends and people we wanted to work with, so why would we have gone anywhere else? But Dennis Condry always said, I don't worry about getting myself over, let's get the match over, and if the match is over, then we'll get over. And that's what we always did, and with the rock and roll, it was, it was easy. You couldn't, you couldn't have a bad match, it was only a, a question of the stage of how good the match was gonna be with the rock and roll. And that's, it worked in 84 in Louisiana, it worked in 86 and 87 in Mid-Atlantic. It worked when they came back in 88 and 89. And we had a Wrestle War main event, uh, co-main event, um, in 1990 on pay-per-view in Greensboro. And that tore the house down. It would work today, probably. Well, when, when we, had, we had the reunions in, uh, in uh, the mid-2000s, uh, you know, when Dennis came back around and, and we had the reunion matches, and... You know, hey, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on pay-per-view up against, you know, uh, 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 the, the top young 25. I wouldn't put it up against Davy Richards and Eddie Edwards in Ring of Honor, but the people loved to see the rock and roll in the midnight. And I, I joked we, we were going to try to break Bobo Brazil and the Sheik's record, but they, they ended up working against each other like 30-something years in a row, and, and I'm not falling down anymore on purpose. So, <laughs> so. Here's a random question. What do you think about guys... Not just anybody specific, but maybe like a Ricky Morton still having to go out there and wrestle. Is that these guys from the Crockett era are still having to go out there and earn money that way? Because I know Ricky's doing it three or four times a week still. You know, there there's a difference. Look at Ric Flair. Um, Rick, if Ric Flair had Donald Trump's money, he'd still want to wrestle. There's a difference between having to and wanting to. Who am I to say what position anybody's in sometimes you can't get it out of your blood sometimes you can't quit wrestling uh it's it's an addiction it's a sickness it's the wrestling sickness um i think a lot of times for a lot of these guys regardless of their financial situation they'd keep wrestling just because they love it and that's what they've done and that's all they want to do i know that right now i can't cut the promo i don't have the wind and i can't take the bumps because i don't have the body that i used to and i'd prefer not to go out and just do a half-assed job of it and so i've moved on to do different things but i can't i can't tell anybody to quit wrestling because so i've been you know it's been 30 years and i i keep saying yeah i'm going to and then i don't so how am i going to tell anybody else to quit uh, the wrap-up yeah let's get back to crockett uh, how will you remember the Jim Crockett promotion era? 
It's not the most money that I ever made in wrestling, but it's the most money I ever made on payoffs that I earned because of the money we drew. It was a tremendous time. The, the, the crew was, you know, without parallel. The, the, the company, for the most part, was run smoothly. The shows were professional. Everything about the Carolinas, as you see the, the uh, progression, the evolution from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s to the 80s, the Carolinas were always a well-run business, a well-run promotion with top talent that got bigger and better from the programs going from black and white to color to slick paper to great photography to the talent going from really good guys to nationally known names to worldwide names uh, to the gates getting bigger and bigger. For years and years, Jim Crockett Promotions and Mid-Atlantic Wrestling was the Cadillac of NWA territories and that's a place where almost everybody wanted to work and they featured the best talent in some of the greatest wrestling cities. The fans in the Carolinas loved wrestling more really than almost anywhere else in the country and I'm happy to have been able to be a part of it right at the, at, at the time where it was the best and also where it, at the, it was at the time where it was almost over but I snuck in there and, and got to experience it and I think overall my time with the Midnight Express and in Mid-Atlantic Wrestling working for Jim Crockett Promotions was probably